The next major topic is a different way of looking at mechanics and mechanical systems called waves. So far we've been working primarily with the particle model. Physics happens to things with discrete locations. Sometimes we allowed objects to be made of multiple particles, but every one of those had a distinct location. The field model complicated that a little because now particles could emanate fields that extend in space, but they were still interactions between particles. Now we're going to add a new model, the so-called wave model. It will share some aspects of oscillators and some aspects of fields, and encompasses multiple phenomena such as strings, sound, and light. But our primary focus in this class will be on light. What is a wave? Well, simply put, a wave is a disturbance that transfers energy without any large-scale motion of matter. Waves ex exist intrinsically as functions of space and time. All right, this is uh, the distinction between, maybe the best example I've come up with is, imagine someone drops a bottle of perfume. You, it takes minutes for that perfume to permeate the room. So if you're at the far end of the room, it might be a couple minutes before you smell the perfume. But you'll hear it right away because the sound waves travel from the perfume to your ear. And no particular piece of perfume travels to your ear. The sound is pressure in the wave in the air that moves back and forth, but there's no large scale motion. All right? That's why it takes a while. You have to wait for diffusion to smell it because you actually have to have a perfume particle in your nose to smell it, but you don't have to wait to hear it because the change in pressure of the air is enough to move your eardrum. A so-called mechanical wave requires something to move through, something we call a medium, which comes from Latin for between, the thing between you, the source, and the observer. The something here has to have an equilibrium state and a restoring force. An example, a classic example is sound, or as drawn over here, uh, water waves. We dunk something in the water, and the water moves up and down, and an outward ripple uh, moves as the surface of the water is disturbed, even though the water doesn't move from here to here. If you had a piece of cork, it wouldn't drift over like this. It would bob up and down, even though the pattern is moving to the side. A wave emanates from a source, which creates a disturbance, and then equilibrium forces propagate that disturbance at a wave speed, V, which again is the speed of the pattern moving over, not the speed of the water. Some wave types don't require a medium. Yeah, it's weird. Two examples are electromagnetic waves and matter waves. Electromagnetic waves are oscillations of electric magnetic fields, and matter waves, which is a term I don't particularly love, are a strange quantum mechanical concept about the probability of finding particles in different places, which mathematically evolves like a wave, and so we say are themselves wave-like. We'll revisit that in a different unit. A different way to characterize waves is based on how the disturbance compares to the motion of propagation. A transverse wave is one in which the particles in the medium move perpendicular to the direction of the, in which the wave travels. So if we're looking at this, someone snapping a rope, they move their hand up and down, every part of the rope moves up and down, and yet the bump moves over. All right, the pattern that is the bump, not the piece of the rope that is this dot, that just goes up and down. But then the peak moves up, and so sometime later it looks like this, where the location of the maximum has moved, but this point has not. This point is now down here. It's moved up and down. Turns out electromagnetic waves are also transverse because electric fields perpendicular to the direction of motion. Even though there's no medium here, the field that's carrying the information is perpendicular to the direction the thing moves. Incidentally, the magnetic field is also perpendicular because they have to be perpendicular to each other. In contrast, a longitudinal wave is one in which the particles move along the direction of the wave's motion, although they still oscillate back and forth. So here the person pulls back and forth on the slinky, and this dot moves towards their hand and away from their hand, and so there's a, a compression and, and an expansion, but the dot itself doesn't move down to here. The dot just goes back and forth, but the place of overpressure, the high density, goes travels down. The same way this peak moves down, the peak in pressure moves down. And the usual example for this are sound waves, which must be longitudinal. This is a relatively clean illustration of these two using a long slinky wave where uh, the top one will be a transverse wave and the bottom one will be a longitudinal wave and we can just see how they repeat. And again, keep your eye on, let's say, that point. You can see that this point, that coil moves up and moves down and comes back. Or that coil moves in and moves out and comes back. But in neither case does that actual, that coil end up later in the wave. 
All right, as said before, the poster child for longitudinal waves is sound, which consists of waves of disturbance in air pressure, or equivalently in density, and that prop propagate longitudinally. The basic idea here being, of course, like the speaker is a diaphragm that, say, moves this way and creates regions of low pressure, so the air flows into it, and then comes back and compresses it, pushes it together and creates regions of high pressure. And so here we just have, essentially, I guess this is a smoke picture, um, we have regions of high density and regions of low density. High density is high pressure, so these will diffuse out into the low density regions, making them higher pr pressure, but then they'll have filled in from either side. And so what you'll have is, um, you'll have what's right now high, low, high, low, high, low, and sort of room <laughs> background. And then eventually we come low, high, low, high, low, high, and then the room over here, and so on back and forth. They'll keep alternating back and forth for as long as the speaker oscillates back and forth. Water waves are weird. They move circularly, which is not one reason that we say that they roll on the ocean. If you were to watch a piece of cork in, uh, in the ocean, it is carried forward but then goes down and is carried back up and ends up more or less where it started. So instead of just bobbing up and down, it sort of does this rolling motion as the waves go strong. Notice that this is neither transverse nor longitudinal. Those are not exclusive dichotomies. They're just two, the two major ways of classifying waves. All right, here we have a video of people doing the so-called wave at a stadium. You can see there as they stand up and sit down. And the question is, what kind of wave is this? Is it longitudinal or transverse? And again, if we watch the people, they stand up and sit down. They don't move along the direction. Let's watch that one more time. They don't, right, the wave itself is moving like that. You can see as it moves across. But no person walks that way. They just go up and down. So this is a transverse wave. All right, some properties of waves. A wave can be thought of a pattern that moves through space. Simple waves will be periodic in space. Then if you take a snapshot as at a single instant, the wave will appear over and over again. The distance that you must travel in order for the pattern to repeat along one of these snapshots, so we freeze in time, that is, the sense, that is, in a sense, the length of the wave is called, logically enough, the wavelength, and symbolized by lambda. Notice that wavelength in English is one word, even though wave speed, for instance, is not. There's no good reason for that, it's just the way it is. Notice that in this case, the wavelength plays the same role for space that the period has played for time. The drawings here represent snapshots taken of waves traveling to the right along strings. The grids shown in the background are identical, and the waves all have the same speed, but their amplitudes vary. Draw a blue circle around waves at the greatest wavelength, and red circle around things that have the least. Important words to come out. Most importantly, they have the same speed, and but they have varying amplitudes, which you can see from the graphs. So that was kind of redundant, because the grids are identical. Here we can just figure out what the wavelengths are. This is one repetition here. That's clearly three. This is one repetition here. That's two. Here we assume it's going to repeat. At least it's going in the right pattern, and we're told that it's a wave. It takes the entire six grids. And this one, even though the amplitude is larger, also takes the entire six grids. So we find that these two are the greatest, and this is least. All right, since a wave repeats in time, it also has a period t, and thus a frequency f, remembering, of course, that f is 1 over t. There's no coincidence there. Waves are generally caused by oscillators and share their properties. The difference is that the wave extends over a region of space, so there's more going on there. Because that pattern moves through space, that is, its location changes with time, it must have a speed, which we call, simply enough, the wave speed, and we symbolize by lowercase v. In older texts, people use c for wave speeds, but since the advent of relativity, that's been reserved for the speed of light, and people have moved away from it, so we usually use v, and maybe v sub sound if we're talking about sound waves, or some other indicator. The wave speed is the speed of progression of the pattern, and has no necessary relationship to the speed of the things that make up the medium. Okay, here we have sort of a, a simulation of waves, where we have an oscillator that's going to move up and down along this string of beads, and there's going to be a wave that travels along. The goofy looking picture here is to make the wave really, really long so we don't get any reflection issues. Uh, otherwise, if the wave was finite, if it was tied down at one end, there'd be some complication 
going on. We'll talk about those later. Um, they're very significant. But right now we don't want them, so we're going to make the end essentially very, very far away so we don't have time for the wave to interact down there and do goofiness. All right, and what we're going to see is that this goes up and down, generating a wave. We can see it's a transverse wave. And as we see here, uh, well, let's run through this and I'll walk through it one time each. Okay, I'm going to play that one more time. This point only is going up and down, notice that but the peak is moving over even though every point's only going up and down. It takes one period to go around, during which time the p thing must move one wavelength. The peak must move one wavelength to reproduce itself. All right, so as to get the same pattern on the bottom. We see that during one period of this going up and down, this peak must have moved over one wavelength. Why? Because the wave has to look the same, and the distance you have to travel for the wave to look the same is one lambda. Going back to our definitions of velocities, which is delta x over delta t, we've moved lambda distance in big T time, so our velocity must be lambda over t. Textbooks like to point out that that's the same as lambda times 1 over, one over t, which is lambda f. So you'll often see this written as v equals lambda f, um, which is fine. And if you remember that, that's uh, perfectly OK. But I like to fall back and let want you to understand that this is nothing deep. This is just saying a velocity is a distance over a time. And in this case, the distance is lambda during the time one period t. All right, just to sum that up again, by definition, during the course of one period, every point on the pattern moves over a distance lambda. Why? Because the period is the time to repeat, and the dis wavelength is the distance to repeat. So after one period, the pattern must look exactly the same. Everything must have moved exactly one lambda. And so we get, as indicated before, that v is lambda over t, or lambda times f. Now, for many media, the speed is independent of the frequency. All waves move the same speed, right? just because of the whatever's going on, the mechanism that moves along. This is true for, for instance, sound in air, or for light in a vacuum. Such media are called non-dispersive because different frequencies don't spread out. They stay grouped together. And in such case, the wavelengths and frequencies are inverse to one another. A long wavelength means a small frequency, and a short wavelength me means a high frequency, and vice versa. Um, the opposite of non-dispersive, of course, is dispersive. So, for instance, glass is dispersive for light. Different frequencies of light travel at different speeds through glass, and so a packet of different frequencies will spread out, will disperse with time. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Sound across temperature gradients would be disturbed dispersive. Light is also dispersive in air, but it's a very small effect, so for almost all purposes we treat it as not. We'll come back and quantify that later. All right, the, blue, the drawings here represent snapshots of waves taking, traveling to the right along strings. The grids are identical. The waves have the same frequency, but their amplitudes and wavelengths vary. And you're asked to draw a blue circle around waves with the greatest wave speed and a red circle around waves with the least wave speed. And here we want to highlight they have the same frequency but different wavelengths. In fact, we can see these are what we had before. That lambda is, again, 3 and 2 and 6 and 6. And here we say, well, if v equals lambda f, but the f's are the same, then v and lambda go in the same order. And so we can quickly see that, once again, those are our greatest, and that's our least. All right, a waterproof siren is emitting a sound at a single frequency. The siren is dropped from air into water. Is the wavelength produced by the siren in the water greater than or less than or equal to the wavelength of the waves produced, uh, produced by the siren in the air? And additional piece of information, the speed of sound in water is about four times faster than the speed of sound in air. V equals lambda f. The frequency cannot change. It's being generated by the siren, which is some mechanical thing going back and forth, wah, 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 like that. And that doesn't change even when we drop into water because it's waterproof, so there's no check on that. But we know that the velocity is four times as large. So lambda becomes four times as large. The wavelength is four times longer.
All right, the distance between the compression and the next compression for a sound wave with a velocity of 800 feet per second and a frequency of 400 hertz is 2 feet. If the wave had had a higher frequency, it would travel faster. This is a statement by a student, and we want to criticize or compliment them on that. What, if anything, is wrong? What they have here is that sound is not dispersive in air, and so therefore the speed is going to be constant. So this is definitely going to be wrong. And where something went wrong here is when, if we go to a higher frequency, what actually happens is a lower wavelength because sound is non-dispersive.